Good morning, everyone. So good to be able to share with you again this morning. As I was thinking about what to prepare and just was thinking about what a complex world we live in nowadays. Turn on the news, turn on your neighbors. You can hear your neighbors talking and um, it's just a very complex and unusual situation that we live in. Each day, something new seems to happen or come up that if we allow it, it can steal our joy or make us grieve. We can almost become jaded. Oh yeah, just another one of those crazy things that's happening now in our world. It can cause us to lose our hope. It can cause us to lose our confidence in God. It can also, if we let our surrounding situations influence us, it can infect even our spiritual walk if we're not careful. Well, this morning I want to look at a few verses from Peter's first general epistle, specifically verses 3 through 12 of chapter 1. I believe these verses, and I trust these verses, will encourage us and give us confidence to live in this world, because that's why he wrote them. All those years ago, he was writing to believers living in very similar situations. We know, of course, he was writing to the Gentiles living in an area that is approximately what we call Turkey today, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. They were living under the Roman Empire, and in those days, each city had its own little ensemble of gods, if you will, with a small g, of course. They were required to honor and worship those gods and give them offerings. And if you did the right things, the gods would bless you. And if you did the wrong things, of course, then the gods would do you harm. And alongside this, everyone else in the empire was expected to worship the emperor because, of course, that was for the betterment of the empire and, of course, the betterment of the world. That's the world that they lived in. But they have gone from this old way of living and they found Christ. And they were brought into they were brought out of the empire and into the kingdom of heaven. And they had this old way and the old manner and the old lifestyle and they were expected to do certain things in Christ. and now in this kingdom of heaven they no longer lived that way. They were living in the light of a new reality which had been unfolding for centuries and they were experiencing firsthand. And Peter says something staggering to these people. He says, you are the elect. You are what those prophets in the Old Testament were talking about. It's us. It's you. It's right here. It's right now. And he's encouraging them. Where can you live out this new life? Where can you live out this new kingdom? Do you go off and make a commune and live all by yourself with people who are like-minded? No, that's not what Peter said to do at all. He said, the answer is you live it out right here. Right now, where you are, you're scattered, you're exiles, you're persecuted. You live it out right here, right now. The places where they had always lived and worshipped and played and worked and shopped and eaten, that's where they lived out. This new way, this new life in the kingdom of Christ. And they would see, of course, people who were still living out the old way. And the old way does not mesh with the new way, does it? How are they supposed to communicate with each other? What's going to happen? Well, we're going to see there's going to be what he calls various or diverse trials, temptations, persecutions, and so forth. So we're going to look at a few of these exhortations this morning that Peter gives to this group of people. They will encourage us to a living hope, that living hope which is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and points us to an internal inheritance that is incorruptible. These exhortations will encourage us that trials are coming. Big shock. But those trials are meant to purify us so that, therefore, we can rejoice. They will encourage us that the new life we are living is part of a grand master plan that was formed before time began and will continue on for all of eternity. We are fit perfectly in the place that God has for us. The prophets 
prophesied about it. We're living it out now, and it will continue throughout all of eternity. So we have three parts today. We'll get to them. A living hope, part one. Point one, a living hope. Point two, surviving the stress test. Point three, a trustworthy source. That's what we're going to cover today. So first of all, let's look at verses three through five of 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In these first few verses, Peter gives us kind of the story of our faith and how he helps us understand where we're, what we're doing, what we're living in. These exiles, their pre-Christian lives were not characterized by hope. They didn't know what hope was. But now, they were God's people. Every situation, every task, every setback could be viewed through the eyeglass or the lens of this living hope. That means something to me. <laughs> we look through things through a different lens, don't we? We don't have the same lens we once had before we came into the kingdom of heaven. We have the lens which has the shade of a living hope. A living hope. A living hope. Likewise, we were dead in sin. We didn't understand what hope was. Unbelievers, people in the world, don't understand what hope is. But God brought us in to a living hope. A living hope. Ephesians 2, verse 12, emphasize that. We won't read it for time, but it says, you had no hope before. Before, we had no hope. We didn't understand it. We certainly didn't have any. And we didn't understand what that meant. But God caused us to be born again into a living hope. And where does that hope begin? It begins in an empty tomb. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate his birth. We love to celebrate his birth. But for me, the rubber meets the road at the resurrection. A lot of great men and women were born. But only one rose from the dead, right? Only one says, has the power of resurrection life. This living hope, it's not dependent upon our environment. It's not dependent, thank God, on our outward circumstances. It doesn't float in clouds of wishful thinking. Oh, I hope that happens. That's not what hope is. It's not just, oh, let's wait and see, and hopefully it'll work out. That's not hope. It springs from a tomb that once held the body of the crucified Lord, but is now empty because he has the power. And that's where our hope is. It's in that resurrection power. It's in him who has the power over life and death. That certainly changes the lens that we look through things, doesn't it? We're rooted in the one who rose from the dead. That's who we're looking towards. The one who had the power to raise him from the dead. That's where my hope is. It's not in what's going on around me. And if God, if, since God raised his son, Christ, Jesus Christ from the dead, is there anything that he can't do? Right? He has the power over death, literally. Is there anything that's too hard for him? That's living hope. Is it so impossible for him to set us free from things that once bound us? Is, is, is there any limit that we can place on him when we look through the lens of the resurrection power over death, over hell, over everything? Is there anything too hard for him? That's hope. That's living hope. So hope here does not imply wishful thinking, but rather a dynamic confidence that does not end with this life, but continues on into eternity. As we look at verse 4, we look forward to an inheritance. We look forward to an inheritance here. It says, an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, and it's reserved for us in heaven. Now, we look forward to many things. I'm looking forward to lunch in about 45 minutes. 
We look forward to our inheritance. We look forward to our paycheck or whatever check you might get coming in once a month. Maybe you look forward to golf on Saturday morning. That's what I look forward to as well. It's okay to look forward to some of those things, going to the beach or wherever. But those things all fade, and those things are all corruptible. If it rains on Saturday morning like it's raining right now, guess who's not going golfing? This guy right here. I'm going to be home and in bed. <laughs> or probably comforting my dog is probably what I'll end up doing. <laughs> Those things all fade away. Stock market can crash. Think about the 20s when we had the stock market crash. All of these men and women who had had all their money and all of these things, it went through the, root, through the basement, through the floor. All that money that they had trusted in was gone. All of these things can fail. In 2020, we, thought, we saw a lot of things canceled, didn't we? We thought a lot of things that we had once hoped in or put our trust in kind of fade away. There were no Olympics. There was no Ryder Cup. Oh, my goodness. But one thing never fades. That's the inheritance that God has for us. It's waiting for you in heaven. Not only now, if we go to verse 5, not only does he keep our inheritance safe in heaven, he keeps us safe as well. He says here in verse 5, you are kept, guarded, preserved, protected by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We are guarded or shielded by God's power. He keeps us safe from external attack and safe within the protective boundaries of his kingdom. We're safe, we're guarded, we're kept, as long as we stay within those boundaries of his kingdom. Now, we can go off and do our own thing, right? But he keeps us safe when we are within the boundaries that he has given us. When you see a, a parent and a toddler crossing the street, you see him holding hands, right? Now, that little child might think, oh, I'm holding daddy's hand or I'm holding mommy's hand, but that's not the reality, is it? In reality, mom and dad are holding on tight. So if that little child gets distracted by something, which little children can do and tries to run away, they go, nope, nope, back here, <laughs> follow me. And if something happens, they can quickly pick them up or do whatever they need to do to protect them. Well, as we're holding on to his hand, he's also holding on to ours. And if we try to get distracted in his trail, he can say, no, no, come on back, come on back. Or he can pick us up when he needs to and drive us the same way. He guards us. He protects us. As long as we are within his boundaries. He is in, Peter's encouraging his readers and also us, you know, that when tough times come, it's not our strength that keeps us. It says we're kept by his power, by his power. Now, thank goodness for that, because I can be very weak when a trial comes. You feel very weak, and sometimes physically you are weak, and mentally you're weak. Thank goodness it's not my strength, because I don't know if I could do it. It's his. It's his power. He's the one who leads us along the way. It says we're kept by his power through faith. Through faith. Our response to God's election and the Holy Spirit's conviction is faith. It's essential for our discipleship, it's essential for our growth, it's essential for our walk. And it's by faith that we live for him day by day. We are also instructed to use that faith as a shield, right? We, we've talked about that several times. Use that shield to, to, to hold off the attacks of the enemy. <clears throat> the key to using that shield of faith is the power that God gives us, right? Dunamis, dynamite, dynamic power. It's not our own power. It's God's power. The promise of Jesus to us is that when we receive the Holy Spirit, we also receive power, right? Acts 1.8. It's the power that comes with it. And that's dynamic, dunamis, dynamite power. Everything flows. It's not our power, it's his. So as we move on, ask yourself, how is this living hope shaping the way I live my life today? How is this living hope, this lens, shaping the way I live my life today? Now, I can't answer that question for you. Ask that question yourself. How is this living hope affecting the way I live my life? How might focusing on the resurrection power 
change the way I live my life? How might focusing on the resurrection power strengthen my hope? Now, surviving the stress test. 1 Peter 1, 6-9. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now, the ESV says you are grieved by various trials, which I like the way they say that, but we leave manifold in because it ties nicely with one of our points. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now the ESV also, verse 9, that the trial of your faith says the tested genuineness of your faith. The trials lead the, to the tested, proven genuineness of your faith. When I was younger, I don't know how old it was. Mom, if you're watching, you'll have to text me later and tell me. But I was in a, a science competition called Olympics of the Mind. And we, was, we had to go to, it was me and a couple of my friends. We went to this place in Michigan and we were the, the, the mind Olympics, I guess. And we were given a task. We had to put together a, a structure out of balsa wood and Elmer's glue, basically. And balsa wood, if you know, is just more water than anything else. If you, but it very flimsy, pliable, but it, when put together in the right way, it can withstand a fair amount of weight. And we had a competition where we had to put our structure together and then the moderators of the competition would come in and they'd put weights on it and try to crush our work. Stress test, right? Stress test. Let's see how much weight this thing will inhabit. And that's exactly, I always think about that when I think about the trial of your faith. I think of stress test. It's not God just seeing how much you can handle, but it's proving you. It's purifying you so that you're able to withstand more. So you're able to withstand more. That's how trials can bring joy. It's not that we minimize the trial. So Peter, he knew a lot about discouragement. He knew a lot about grief. He knew a lot about suffering. And if you notice here, not once does he say, oh, just suck it up and move on. He says, no, you're grieved. It's right that you're grieved, but you can rejoice because it's doing something in you. It's doing something in you. Grief is not the end. Grief is kind of a a side effect, if you will, of a stress test. But it's not the end. It's not the focus. The purity of gold is brought forth by intense heat. So the reality and purity of your faith are revealed as a result of those fiery trials that we face. The focus of the trial is what comes out in the end. That's pure gold, strengthened, established. Or if you think about it in terms of stress tests, you you get forged steel. You get forged steel that's forged in fire that's unbreakable almost. That's what you get. Forged steel. Pure gold. During our trials, God is assuring us there's a positive purpose. Yes, you're grieved, of course. Yes, it's painful, of course. But knowing that God is doing something helps. It doesn't take the pain away sometimes, but it does help. And it also leads to that joy unspeakable, unspeakable joy, points us to the joy of the trials, verses 8 and 9. In the midst of these trials, we can experience authentic joy. You see, the joy of the Lord is something totally different than joy of Christmas or the joy that you see on those signs all over the place. The joy of the Lord is authentic. It's pure. And again, it's dynamic. It's dynamic. It's authentic, holy, divine joy that can only come from him. It doesn't come from the externals in life. Because if it did, we would never be able to rejoice in trials, would we? Right? If it came from our external circumstances, a lot of us would be walking around holding our heads pretty low because there's a lot going on right now. But the authentic fruit of the Spirit, joy that's divine, dynamic, doesn't care what the circumstances around you are. It bubbles up within you, and almost like you can't help yourself. 
And even though you're crying, you're still dancing with joy because you know what God is doing in you. That's where that joy comes from. The joy unspeakable. It reminds me of that old hymn. Some of you old timers might know it. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. I had to look it up, but I remember some of it. (laughs) Now, we would be remiss in looking at these verses if we didn't talk about that word manifold, which is why I chose the KJV. Manifold means various, many-hued, many-colored. Different trials. Not all trials are the same. My trial is not the same as Henry's. It's not the same as Les's. And theirs are not the same as mine. We go through different things. And if you look at 1 Peter 4, verse 10, as every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So it's very important before we move to the last point. Manifold is the same word, various, many-hued, many-colored, manifold trials. Everyone is different. But the great thing about all of this is the manifold grace. The same thing. Many-hued, various. You know why? Because you need a specific enabling power, which is what grace really is, divine enablement. You need specific divine enablement for the specific circumstance that you're in. It's not a one-size-fits-all. You need to pray for the specific grace to get through. And the great thing is, it all comes from God. It's divine. And not only that, but Jesus Christ, who was in all points tempted, just like we were. So he's experienced it. He knows. He can go to his toolkit and say, yep, this is the one they need. Let's give it to them. But we have to ask for it. All right? So... Before we move to the last point, ask yourself if you're going through times where your faith has been stress tested. I think the answer to that one is pretty easy. What does the fact that we came through those trials say about the genuineness of our faith? What does the fact of how we went through it and came out on the other side say about the genuineness of our faith? Maybe we need another trial. Maybe we need the same trial over again sometimes, so that we can get the get to the point. What does it say about the faithfulness of God that he takes us through the way he does? Finally, a trustworthy source, verses 10 through 12. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicated when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that you that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. It's difficult to continue believing in a living and living a godly life when you are in consistent trials and struggle. It's difficult. Peter knew firsthand what it was like to go through these consistent trials, to go through depression, probably, to go through discouragement, more than likely, to go through persecution, definitely. That's why he wrote the book. He says, I know what it's like. You guys are going through it. You need this book. We need this book. That's why he wrote them. To encourage. It says to establish, to strengthen, to settle them. That what you're going through is not unusual. And these are the keys to getting through. He wrote to encourage them that they have that living hope. They can look to the resurrection power and they can receive the joy of the Lord. And now he looks to the source of the message and says, this is what the prophets were talking about. This is exactly what Isaiah was talking about when he talked about the lamb who was slain, who was on the cross, who was wounded for our transgressions. This is the Messiah, the chosen one. This is what the elect means. This is it. This is us. Long before the birth of Christ, the prophets were inquiring inquiring about this salvation. They searched it out. They were looking to understand it. The Holy Spirit revealed it to them, and they wrote on it. They wrote on the coming of this salvation. They longed for it to take place in their times, and Peter's saying they longed about it. They searched for it. The Holy Spirit had to show it to them. You are living it. You're living it. We are living it. 
it was revealed to them that their, prof, their prophetic words, their visions, their dreams, they weren't serving themselves. They were actually serving us. They're here for our encouragement, our edification. Our, and it, yes, of course, it did help them as well. It, it helped them. But the, the bigger part of it, the larger part, the enduring part was that which is eternal. It's affecting lives to come for all of eternity. And Peter is kind of giving an eye-opening statement. He's saying, this is for you. This is this whole thing right here. Yeah, that's all about you. This is what we're living right now. And man, you can really take encouragement that thousands of years ago, they were writing about times that we're living in. We're living them out right now. That's encouraging. You know why it's encouraging? Because I know that there's a trustworthy source. I'm part of a master plan. I'm living my piece of whatever the puzzle is. I don't know all of it. And I'm, most of the time I'm thankful. Sometimes I say, Lord, can you just show me how this all ends? And then I think about it for a minute. I say, you know what? Cancel that request. <laughs> I'm going to live because I don't know if I could handle it. I don't. Maybe you could. Maybe you couldn't. But he shows us what we need. But the great thing is, is we can look back and see where we fit. We are part of something. And it's true. It's authentic. When they wrote and spoke, it, was just not, it, was, it wasn't just a hyperactive imagination. They looked intently with greatest care, it says. And God gave them that through the Holy Spirit. So we can be confident in what God is doing. So finally, the source is pure. It's authentic. This is not a man-made myth. It's a divine reality. We may be worn down by whatever's occurring, persecution in whatever shape that's taking for you, or trials, whatever shape that's taking, we may be wore down. But the good news is that there's a plan. It's not random. Somebody didn't just roll the dice and say, let's see what's happening. It's a plan. It's God's plan. And, and he's been speaking about it. He's been sharing about it. He's been inspiring people through his Holy Spirit for thousands upon thousands of years. And if you really want to get macro on this, before time began, he was thinking about it. He was planning it. Wrap your head around that. It might take a little bit. <laughs> it takes me a long time to think about, what do you mean before time began? I don't understand how that works. But that's how God works. He's thinking about it that way. He's thinking about it that way. And in fact, it's such a marvelous message that even the angels of heaven desire to look in on it and say, what's going on down there? Because they haven't experienced salvation. They were created the way they are. So they look down and they say, I want to understand what this is. And they want to learn. It says uh, the, the Greek word used here, without getting too technical, is they stoop down to take a peek and look in and say, isn't that wonderful? what they're going through. Isn't that wonderful? They want to peek in at what this wonderful salvation is all about. And guess what? We're living it right now. We're living it. To me, that's encouraging. So as we, or so as we move to the conclusion, what convinces you of the gospel's trustworthiness? What convinces you? I can't answer that question for you. What convinces you of the gospel's trustworthiness. What does or what would being confident in the gospel look like to you in your everyday life? Again, I can't answer that for you. What does it mean to you to be confident in the gospel of Jesus Christ? To be confident that what he's doing is leading me somewhere towards this master plan. So as we close, you know, that tortoise believed life's rewards and life rewards and is dedicated, the tortoise and the hare. Life rewards the dedicated and ends up crossing the finish line before the hare, right? That's what the tortoise believed. That was his perspective. I'm going to be dedicated, I'm going to be slow and methodical, and I'm going to win it out. Chicken Little, on the other hand, had a completely different perspective, didn't he? He's like, the sky is falling, the whole world's coming against me, and what happens to Chicken Little in the end? It's not very good. The lens we view things on, right? The lens we through which we view things affects how we walk and live our life. The lens of that living hope, the perspective, and how we look at eternity shapes what we think is good and what we think is bad. Sometimes it's not the same. It, sometimes what we think might be bad is actually good. But we need our lens cleaned up a little bit. 
all right? How we view ourselves, how we view others, all of that is shaped by how we look at things. And Peter, again, he experienced what this discouragement was all about, and he was writing this for us. Well, he was writing it originally for them, but we get to experience it because it was recorded for all who to read, and that's where that encouragement comes from. So if you feel hopeless today, or maybe you're starting to feel hopeless, be encouraged. This living hope can really change our perspective. You might find that a difficult trial is upon you. Maybe it's been upon you for a long time. Maybe it has no light at the end of the tunnel. At least that's what our perspective is. But know that God's power, God's resurrection power, God's plan is moving. He's doing something. He's purifying us. Maybe he's just stress testing you to see how much you can handle so he knows if he needs to clean you up some more or maybe get you some, move on, move you on to something else. But it gives us that inexplicable, unexplainable, unspeakable joy that we can't describe because it's divine. All right. And if you've lost your confidence, look to the scriptures and see what God's been saying about the days in which we're living through this entire book. It fills me with hope. Amen. Thank you.